Mr. Evanina, welcome. Um, the DOD has recently banned sales of ZT phones at military exchanges, as well as uh, Huawei equipment. And last month, the Commerce Department banned China's smartphone maker ZTE from using U.S. technology uh, after it illegally shipped U.S. goods to both Iran and to North Korea. Um, this comes after numerous intelligence community warnings that ZTE poses a major cybersecurity threat. Uh, yet, as we saw this week, President Trump announced that he is working with the Chinese president to give ZTE, quote, a way to get back into business fast, end quote. Do you assess that ZTE represents an economic or security threat to the United States? Thank you for that question, Senator. I, I believe the intelligence community and law enforcement is clearly on the record, uh, both in the public and in classified settings, with the threat from uh, Chinese telecommunications companies. Are you concerned uh, that the from a counterintelligence perspective that, uh, you know, does it make sense to overrule the advice and judgment of the national security community and to offer ZTE a, uh, a way to get back into business fast? Thank you, Senator. I, I believe our role in the intelligence community and the counterintelligence community is to provide the relevant facts of the issue and the investigations to the policymakers for their decision-making processes. How are you raising those facts with, uh, with this White House? Uh, we are garnering the support of the entire intelligence community and regulatory community. And as a matter of fact, I think we've had meetings as well as uh, recent as yesterday at the White House. If China believes that we are willing to use national security matters as uh, as bargaining chips uh, in trade negotiations, how um, how do you think that'll impact their behavior moving forward? Senator, thanks for that question. I'm not an expert on the Chinese uh, diplomatic processes, but I can tell you that our national security is first and foremost in our perspective, and the whole country approach posed by China clearly makes it difficult for us to bifurcate the issues. So two months ago, DHS and the FBI issued a rare public alert about a large-scale Russian cyber campaign targeting US, the U.S. power grid uh, and other critical infrastructure with an intent to extract information and potentially lay a foundation for future offensive operations. This alert went further than past alerts confirming Russia as the culprit and including indicators of compromise and a list of detection and prevention measures. What's happened since May of 2018, uh, or sorry, March of this year when the alert went out, and is this Russian cyber campaign ongoing? Um, Senator, thank you for that question, and, and I would agree that the, the pervasive threat from a cyber perspective by the Russian government uh, continues today and will into the future. Uh, the federal government, uh, specifically the Intelligence community and federal law enforcement and DHS have been working with the private sector uh, every day. As a matter of fact, NCSC, we brought in uh, not only the Department of Energy, uh, but major companies in the fuel, gas, and oil perspective to give them a one-day read-in and a classified brief of the threat, and, and so we could help them mitigate those issues back in their home facilities. Did that include utilities as well? It did. Are you seeing a greater sense of urg urgency on the part of utility companies and other uh, energy institutions to utilize this new information? Yes. Um, are we getting utility leadership through the clearance process fast enough? Uh, I'm not sure about that, Senator. I have to get back to you with respect to the speed at which that's occurring. Because that uh, that's another concern, and I, I know Senator Warner brought up the overall issue. I mean, one of the uh, things that we have heard on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee is that even former members of Congress who served on the intelligence, uh, relevant intelligence committee can't get through that process. And so if we don't have partners who are read in on the other side, it makes it very difficult for those utilities and those other uh, energy institutions to actually implement the changes that they need to implement. Uh, thank you, Senator. I believe uh, working closely with DHS, they are working uh, diligently to provide an expeditious process to get individuals and companies cleared so they can receive this threat information on a real-time basis. You, you said that continuous evaluation is not the future. It's now, and that the government honestly has not done a good job. Um, industry is able to conduct continuous evaluation of their employees. Why has it been difficult for the government to do so, and, and what can we do about that? 
Thank you, Senator, for the question. And continuous evaluation has been a constant bedrock in the intelligence community for years. Uh, we, we've been asked to do it, NCSC, through the auspices of the ODNI from this committee, is provide a robust continuous evaluation program for the rest of the executive branch. And we have done that. We are uh, probably 80 percent complete ahead of schedule, hope to be fully complete by the end of the year. Uh, we are expecting to have 20 plus agencies and 100,000 federal employees outside the intelligence community enrolled into our continuous evaluation plan. Thank you, Mr. Avenida. Thank you, Mr. Chair.